I am Evie Alexander. I am a science teacher in New York City. Meet Evie Alexander, a science teacher in New York City with a very cool story. I used to be a microbiology researcher and a vet tech, but then I decided to get into education and teaching. But that's not all that's cool about Evie. She also runs a popular Instagram account showcasing the incredible world of microbiology. I urge you all to go check out her account. So the origin story to my Instagram account, we were in environmental science class and I started off collecting some soil samples. We looked at the soil samples under the microscope and it was a bunch of little microorganisms. At the time, I don't know what they were. And so I was like, wow, this is so cool. So I started collecting more samples and then I needed help identifying these organisms that I was finding under the microscope. So I was like, well, maybe I'll go on Instagram because it's very visual and I'll post my pictures and then I'll hashtag them and see if anyone you know, has anything that's similar that I could find. And then I realized there was literally this entire community of people on Instagram who just posted protozoans and posted microorganisms. So through that, I was able to identify a lot of things and to learn a lot from these people. You know, I found some really cool stuff. I kept posting and more and more people followed. And here we are like a year and a half later. It was completely unexpected. It's likely that you've read headlines of little organisms called tardigrades that can survive in space and all that jazz. but. Are they really the toughest? This is actually my favorite question. So having seen many, many, many slides and having found multiple tardigrades, I will say that tardigrades themselves are not tough. So what is tough about the tardigrade is not the animal. It's when they roll into their ton. So their ton is like this protective cocoon. What they do is they basically dehydrate themselves and they roll into this ton. It takes about an hour or so. And this ton is the one that is like, you know, gamma ray proof and space proof and whatever proof. But if you actually have like an, a real tardigrade, a real live tardigrade, they're very squishy. They're very fragile. They don't really like environments with low oxygen. So they die easily. They can get infected by bacteria. They can be poisoned by bacteria. I've seen tardigrades die because the environment has too high of a bacteria population. So yeah, tardigrades are not that tough. And there's only certain places that I find them in. There's certain types of water that they're in, and it's usually very pristine water. I hate telling people that because everyone wants to hear that tardigrades are the toughest. I'm like, no, no, they're not. I'm sorry. So the headlines we've all read about tardigrades being the toughest organisms isn't 100% accurate. But if they're not, then... What is? The toughest animal that I have seen are actually rotifers. So they're very similar to tardigrades in that they too can roll into a ton. And if you ever look at like a brand new moss sample, so you scrape the moss off the rock, you hydrate it with a little bit of spring water, and then you look at it under the microscope about 20 minutes later, you will see all of these rotifers like emerging from their tons. And they're in polluted water, they're in like mud puddles, they're in moss, they're everywhere. And I find more rotifers than I do tardigrades. Rotifers are not only tougher than tardigrades, but also are found more often by Eevee. But what's the most common microorganism? I would say the most common is bacteria, but that's not really fun. I would say the most fun and common are going to be rotifers. Rotifers are not actually protists. They actually fall under the animal kingdom. So they're these tiny animals basically that have a tail, a body, a head, um, and they're this giant stomach that's eating things and chewing things its way through all kinds of samples. And all the samples I've collected, I would say every single one of them, eventually the rotifers will turn up. So they would be the most common. Microorganisms have a lot of interesting internal evolution with importance that should not be overlooked. But how did they reproduce to get diversity for evolution? When conditions are good, like when there's lots of food and there's plenty of oxygen, they are asexual. So they will just make copies of themselves. And, you know, that's kind of the goal is you want to make lots of copies and consume all the resources. When times are bad is when they go through sexual reproduction. So because they're single cell, they don't have organs like we do. So what they do is they have what's called oral grooves for a paramecium. And what they'll do, the oral groove is basically like, their mouths. And so what they'll do is they'll kind of match up their oral grooves and then through the oral grooves, they'll actually exchange pieces of their DNA. And that's how they get genetic diversity. And then they'll detach and then they'll go through asexual reproduction or they'll go through a cyst. And then hopefully with that genetic variation, they can survive the stressful times. So it's like kissing your partner, swapping DNA, then duplicating yourself to make your child. That's how these microorganisms get genetic diversity. But do humans affect microevolution? Yeah, humans can affect these organisms 
effect. I think our effects don't really make the news because one, people don't really know that these things exist. And two, I get a lot of questions where people ask me like, well, what's the purpose? Well, they don't really have a purpose. They're just there, but they are part of a food chain and or food web actually. And we're part of a food web. So just to kind of illustrate, I guess the uh, ripple effect. So let's say you have increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because we are producing lots of carbon dioxide from our cars and our factories. So once again, carbon dioxide is soluble in water. And this is kind of like soda, you know, you have carbon dioxide dissolved in soda. So that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will actually dissolve into the ponds and the lakes and the oceans. And so these bodies of waters are what we call sinks. And they're sinks because they're kind of like a storage area for extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The more carbon dioxide you dissolve into water, you have an increase in acidity because you create carbonic acid. As the acidity increases and as the temperature increases, you're going to see changes in things like diatoms. So diatoms and green algae are literally the bottom, bottom, bottom of the food chain. So when you're in third grade and you're learning about food chains, you have grass or like, you know, the plant as or the flower as the bottom of the food chain. But when you really think about it, the bottom of the food chain is truly these green algae, these microscopic green algae. And they're the ones that are actually responsible for producing 40 to 70 percent of the oxygen in our atmosphere. So their population is going to change based on the carbonic acid and the temperature of the water. Um, if we put fertilizer in the water, that's going to change their population. So when their population changes, that will then change the population of the organisms that eat them. An algae blooms when the algae grows out of control. When that happens, the bacteria then grows out of control because they love eating the algae. They consume all the oxygen, and then now you have a dead zone where nothing can grow because there's no more oxygen because you have this massive boom in population. So basically any changes to aquatic ecosystems that we do, that we make like fertilizer, even oil spills, uh, any kind of pollution, dumping sewage in there, all of those things will change the ecosystem. And so it's a ripple effect because once you've changed the algae population, you're gonna change the bacteria, which means you're gonna change the ciliates, the amoebas that eat them, which means you're gonna change the uh, shrimps, and then you're gonna change the small fish that eat those shrimp, and then you're gonna change all the things that eat the small fish. And then now we're getting to animals that we can see. So by the time you get to dead fish, that's already very, very far on the top of the food chain. You've heard right. The environmental effects we cause affects all levels of life, even the life that you may never see with your naked eye. Now, before we let Evie go, let's get one last fun fact. So when a ciliate dies, they explode. And depending on the type of ciliates, some will explode a lot faster than others. I didn't know this until I spent like three or four hours one afternoon, just observing a bunch of ciliates in this one sample I had, they were they were dying very quickly and I have no idea. They were fine when I first put them on the slide, but within like an hour or two, they were all like slowing down and dying. So I just spent the whole afternoon observing them and some would die. You could see all their cilia stop moving and then they would just like gush their cellular contents everywhere. And then some would just die, they would stop moving and then they would kind of like blow up a little bit, like expand. And then there'd be this weird bubble and then they would collapse, but then they wouldn't, they would never really explode. So I thought it was really interesting. And I looked it up and it was because some ciliates have this, what's called a pellicle. So it's like a harder shell on the outside that the cilia can actually stick in and sit inside. So because they have this harder shell, they don't explode. So I thought that was really cool. Boy, all great information. I hope that you all learned something today. And big thanks to Evie. Here's how you can keep up with her. So you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook. I'm Science and NYC on both. Evie also just launched a new incredible channel called Science in NYC, exploring the fascinating micro world. So make sure that you go and subscribe to her channel. Remember to always feed your curiosity, and I'll see you guys on the next upload.